I'm here with my good friend, Mark Pittman, who I haven't seen in a while. We're due. We are overdue for a visit. And Definitely. Mark is a an extremely prolific and experienced fundraising consultant, fundraisingcoach.com. And Ask Without Fear, that's like your big cornerstone book. And then you, you now have Google Plus for nonprofits. Yes. Okay. I almost thought, wow, we should talk about that, but uh, I don't, maybe we should. <laughs> Maybe that'll be a second video. <laughs> so I have Mark here because we're going to talk about donor retention. And for those of you who are watching this video, there's been some research that for-profit companies retain their customers at 90% rate or better. You know, 90% of their customers renew. Nonprofits, on the other hand, are 40% or you said earlier, even 30%. You're right. You know, so so the retention rate is really low in the nonprofit world in uh, in general, and that confuses me because it's much easier to keep a donor or a customer than it is to actually try and convince a brand new one. Well, I remember listening to Mal Warwick years ago um, at a BlackBot conference, and he was talking about different packages and how you had to have all these color and different things you should try for your donor acquisition package, the one that you're trying to introduce your nonprofit to. But then for the retaining people, you could just have a piece of paper, um, front and back, maybe two color, didn't have to be four color, shouldn't be glossy because they'd be worried about people that are already given to you want to make sure their gifts are being used well. So you don't have to spend a lot of money on glitz because um, that isn't necessarily convincing them that you you have the right priorities with their money. Um, and so yeah, it's just the whole dynamic of retaining a donor it should be less expensive, but nonprofits are atrocious at it. Yeah, and I would imagine that someone who's given to you before a previous donor, it, they're probably past the glitz phase. I would think so. You know, it's like going on a Match.com date. You're doing the glitz thing. You're just selling someone, hey, I'm great. <laughs> and then you get engaged and then, you know, things start to go downhill from that. <laughs> what we want to do clearly is they've already given the gift. So that should be an indication to us that they're the short list of people to go to. But I think, I think one of the reasons why... Um, you know, and nonprofits are really good at striking the emotional cord. They have the passion. They have that going. Um, I think we're so bad at the retention in part because we don't focus on it. Most of our reporting, at least in my experience in nonprofits, and most of the questions our CEOs, executive directors, and boards are asking us is, how many donors do we have this year? Um, how many new donors? That There's not often the donor retention. And a lot of our reporting, you have to do some weird uh, – it's not as easy to report on donor retention. Uh, for example, for the first couple of years when I was at the foundation of a hospital in rural Maine, I would report donors that came in, but I wouldn't count pledge payments as new donors because they weren't new donors mathematically or accounting-wise, but they were still the, my board member who had made a pledge payment four years before and was paying it off, he was making a donation every year. He was very clear he was making a donation. So even though it didn't come across my you know, donor relationship management software is a new donor, it was still a new donor, or it was still a donor. So I had to start figuring out um, how to make sure that I included pledge payments as well without cooking the books. I mean, it wasn't new dollars raised, but for the relationship aspect, it was, these guys are making money, they're making gifts, they're investing in our cause on an annual basis, and we're not, we're not thanking them that way, the same way. Uh, it makes me think that a good first step for any nonprofit is to figure out what your retention rate is. Oh, it would be great. The studies say that the average of the United States profit, nonprofits is a 70% retention rate. Then that means there are some that are really good and some that are even worse. But can you imagine um, you know, the whole idea of having 10 donors give and then the next year only three of those give. So you have to not only replace the seven – but you have to get more to grow your donor base. Um, it's one of the things that I was in, in, interviewing Adrian Sargent for a project we're working on on donor retention. And Adrian Sargent's this international guru that studies this stuff. One of the few academics that actually academically studies it instead of anecdotally. Uh, we all have stories about donors that have been retained or something, but he actually looks at statistics uh, and, and across sectors and internationally. One of the things he said was that our whole our wording is wrong. We're talking about annual donors, and we track annual donors, but people don't th see themselves as annual donors. They see themselves as having, this may be overstating it, but a, a relationship with your nonprofit. They've made a gift. 
and I see this a lot with our fiscal years versus calendar years. Um, donors, you know, I've worked in a lot of nonprofits that had, I've worked in nonprofits that had just about any quarter as a f beginning of a fiscal calendar. It's usually, you know, June, July, but I've also had October through September, uh, January, of course, through December. And the January through December is what the donor re re knows. They understand that. So they never understand when we say, well, you're not a consecutive year donor because, yes, you gave two gifts in 2000. You gave a gift in 2010 and 2011, but that was actually our same fiscal year. And so we lose them. We're not thanking them appropriately at all. So one of the things Adrian was talking about is that instead of annual donors, we should think about relationships with donors. And, and building that relationship. So tell me more about that when you say a relationship, because I, when I hear donor, I hear dollars. But when I hear relationship, I hear right. there's a lot more to it. I just put up a blog post that said donors don't need another best friend. Hmm. I think there's a lot of fundraisers that are totally lost focus. They're into this friend raising thing. They're into this being warm and fuzzy and being the golden retriever at the party and making sure everybody feels good. Hmm. But which is not bad. That's an aspect of fundraising. Hmm. But an important part of what we should get graded on every year is did the money come in and if not why not and more than that did the right actions take place to make sure that there's sustainable fundraising hmm. it's not slash and burn fundraising so the relationship is important one of the things that the counterintuitive things that um, Adrian recommends is making a second ask within the first 30, 90 days hmm. after the first gift what, one of the things we tend to do because we think annual donors is once they've made a gift once we leave them alone we don't ask them oh. again yeah. Um, but 25% and other studies have shown that 25% of donors don't even remember that they made a gift hmm. to the nonprofit. It was hmm. just an emotional thing. They did it. And when they're asked why they stopped giving, 20 to 25% don't even, I, I gave to that nonprofit. I had no idea. Really? Wow. Oh. So asking again about something that was compelling to them um, is another way of developing a relationship. It's okay to ask people more than once. Yeah. If it's not over asking if it's developing a relationship and showing them other places that their values, I'm really, as, as you know, I'm really big on, it's all about donors' values meeting our mission. Hmm. Um, that their values can be met through our mission by their investment. Hmm. Um, then you see a lot less donor fatigue when it's about the donors. Tom Ahern talks about the donors being the hero, and Jeff Brooks does too. Uh, making sure it's the donors that are changing the world through your nonprofit, not the nonprofit being amazing. Yeah. It's the donors that are amazing because of what they're choosing to invest in your nonprofit. And that's, that's relationship, but it's also expanding the giving later on. Mm -hmm. You're developing, a, I guess, here's another, I may be rambling, but here's something I did as an alumni director. Mm -hmm. um, I would visit every, it was a prep school, boarding school, high school. I would visit everybody in college. Uh, I, my goal was, the challenge was to take everybody in college out for a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And the reason was I would tell them, we are going to be asking you for money for the rest of your life. And we want you to know now that we're invested in you now before the colleges. Colleges have these fundraising machines. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is let you know that we've been here before you were all that. <laughs> and we want to be part of that relationship now. But mm -hmm. I would always start it with my interaction with you, even though it's relational and buying you a coffee, it's about donations for the high school. Mm -hmm. um, and they totally, being up front like that, they laughed mm -hmm. and they totally, even if they didn't get it at the time, it became something we could talk about over the years. Mm -hmm. Hey, you told me that. You know, I'm out of college now and boy, I'm getting, you know, all these solicitations, but you're right. Stony Brook was there for me mm -hmm. when it was formative stage. So I laid the foundation for a relationship in the context of giving. Two thoughts about what you just said. Language influences behavior. So if, if, an, if, if a nonprofit says, oh, how many donors? The general thinking of a donor is that they give once a year, and that's it. Yeah. So naturally... It's kind of like check off the list. Okay, yeah. they gave, so we won't talk to them again. What? You, what? you can't get... Yeah, the, so the, yeah. The, the thinking is that, oh, we're done. There's no more money there, so we have to move on. Right. And that, that, might be, that might be part of what causes the problem. Because then yes. what do they do? Then there, there's this almost like a hyper focus on getting new people. Why Definitely. retain someone? They just six months ago. That guy is worthless now. He gave six months well, ago. And, no money and at it, all. And getting the new people is important. Because you're always going to have attrition, so you definitely need to be focused on getting new people. But the but when it's all focused on new people and you're bleeding, hemorrhaging 
donors on the other end, um, it's it, your focus has to be on both. It has to be on keeping your growing the relationships, and it, that makes a job confusing. But it also makes it more fulfilling because it's not always getting to know new people and investing all that energy. It's it's building on the successes that you've had with others, whether it's a success through a direct mail campaign and just communicating a story with donors in general or whether it's with major gift donors and being able to say, remember that, how you built five wells there or how you helped six kids here or how you helped spay 100 pets there. We're doing that again and we're doing it even better. And hey, look, we have, if we had this piece of equipment, we could have done those 100 pets in two days instead of in two months. Would you help us with that too? Because this is going to help even more families. Whatever. It's, but it's, it's building that relationship. And actually going back to them and giving them uh, really what I would call opportunities. Because yes. the first time they give, it's because it means so much to them. Why only give that person that experience once a year? That's a little selfish. You know? Yeah, and, that's and a good way to put it, yeah. There's a, there's a pizza restaurant around the corner from where I live, Armando's Pizza. Okay. I love the place. If mm -hmm. I just went there and I bought one pizza and then they told me, you know what? You're good for a year now. You can't have any more pizza. Thanks for buying the pizza, yeah. I'd be like, what? this is what... what parallel universe am I am I living in? That's Interesting. Crazy. That's true because our our local our pizza place Caps is wonderful wonderful guy you know runs this place and yeah I just got an email from him saying that this it's March so here's you know we're still in the middle of winter in Maine Let, let's do something together let's uh, let's have a special so you can get a capitizer it's Caps is capitizer or something mm -hmm. uh, but yeah it was an opportunity to spend more money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he's doing that at least monthly, and then around birthdays and other times, there's opportunities to spend money too. So yeah, yeah. it's a little different with a nonprofit, but I think there's a the the parallel is there. And oh, here's the other part that um, I've been told forever, but I hadn't made the connection until talking to you. Uh, one of the reasons when you have the Giving USA pie chart. Mm. It always shows that religion and education are two of the biggest things that people invest in. Hmm. Part of the reason for religion isn't because it's is, isn't necessarily because of the cause. It's, it's a, because at least in in Christianity and in, in the Protestant and, and Catholic churches, there's a plate being passed it's every the basket week. every week. It's that awkward yeah. moment every Sunday morning when you're passing and you're like, "Well, I gave online. How do you? How, you know, some people even give empty envelopes for people that are online givers, uh, or I don't trust you yet. I'm not giving to you yet. But that is an awkward moment of, <laughs> should I put money in here? And the kids are looking at you. Why aren't you putting money in, yeah, Daddy? You I, I you're a online. fundraiser. <laughs> You have to explain. I, I gave online yeah, last. I night. just gave through my phone. So yeah, I wasn't <laughs> playing Angry Birds. I was actually giving. Yeah. <laughs> right, I was making my donation through my phone. Yeah, oh, sure. That's God. what it's called now. That's brilliant. No, you're right. You're right. But I, I, I bet you. You know, it's these little things that really make such a big difference. I was just doing a post on special events. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I wondered about a way to maximize event donors is to honor the fact that they're event donors, and then say. Thank you for being here. We've raised gobs of money today, and this is going to really help the cause. But as you know, tomorrow, those same kids are going to need education, or those same you know plants are going to need saving, or those same animals are going to need welfare. We're creating a whatever sustaining gala. Mm -hmm. We have monthly donation forms on the tables. Would you consider giving a monthly gift yeah, in addition to attending the gala every year? Mm. Uh, something that shows them that, and, and, and where this is going in relationship with our conversation is that, that idea that the mission is happening throughout the year. It's mm -hmm. not just a one-time event. So there are going to be naturally opportunities to invest in it. Whether you're a political advocacy cause or not, mm -hmm. there are natural opportunities to do that.